My name is Venu and I'm a member of the faculty of Azim Brindji University. And my task is to introduce the topic to all of you uh, without uh, holding forth uh, for too long. Uh, and then invite the members of the panel to present their views. Uh, each panelist will speak uh, for about 15 minutes. And the end of it, there will be a discussion among the members of the panel. And uh, at the end of uh, that discussion, uh, we may also have some time for um, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'm certain that many of us find the names of the panelists uh, very familiar and uh, that there's nothing more exciting uh, than having an opportunity to interact in the flesh and blood with the, uh, with the scholars whose writings you're familiar with and particularly for the students in the room you, uh, whose names you have um, read or writings you have, have been part of your course readings for the last more than a year or so. Um, Dennis Phillips is Emeritus Professor at the School of Education, Stanford University. Uh, in his long career, he has uh, written on philosophy of education, foundations of empirical educational research, indoctrination and directive teaching, teacher knowledge, autonomy and moral development. David Carr is Professor Emeritus of Education, uh, Teaching and Leadership at the Moray House School of Education, University of Edinburgh. His large body of influential writings has tackled issues in philosophy of education such as moral education, nature of knowledge, citizenship and democracy, art education and education of emotions. Professor Carr has also been an important voice in the debates about virtue ethics and value education. Rohit Dhankar is Professor of Philosophy of Education at Azim Premji University, Bangalore. He has been part of several initiatives of the National Council for Educational Research and Training to develop material and curriculum through various committees. He was an integral part of the National Education Frame, uh, sorry, National Curriculum Framework 2005 process, serving as a member of the National Steering Committee and Drafting Committee and chair of the focus group on curriculum, syllabus, and textbooks. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you that uh, the fourth member of the panel, Professor Padma Sarangapani, uh, of the Data Institute of Social Sciences could, can't be here. Uh, she has some domestic exigency and she had to excuse herself this afternoon. Um, now to the task of introducing the theme of today's discussion. Uh, I should perhaps uh, start with a disclaimer. Uh, my comments will be sketchy necessarily and may offend both those who have thought long and hard about these questions and those who approach these issues with a uh, little prior background. However, I'm quite certain that at the end of this discussion, the state of affairs will be substantially remedied, and uh, we are all looking forward to that. Uh, it should come as no surprise to all of us that the three words in the title for this afternoon's discussion and the implied connection between them is fraught with tensions and contestation in educational thought and philosophy. In fact, in the morning I made a mistake of uh, talking to Rohit briefly about what he understood uh, uh, of the theme and he impressed on me that my understanding was completely faulty uh, and, uh, and that in the panel discussion he would uh, set that right. Uh, it took quite a bit of nerve on my part to withdraw quickly and uh, continue, uh, di continue with my decision to talk about what I had thought of saying before about what I thought the panel discussion was all about and that's what I'm going to do. So this intellectual discord is significant for India and other such societies that find themselves in a condition of social, economic and cultural change and turmoil. 
for, for it is under these conditions that we have to explore uh, the nature and organization of the educational system in which the children of this country spend a substantial part of their childhood. The stakes couldn't be any higher. There were about 135 million children in the primary schools in this country in 2010, that is in classes 1 to 5. And there are only eight countries in the world whose total population is higher than this number. To add to this, these students come from a diversity of social, cultural, linguistic, economic and what have you backgrounds that is almost impossible to comprehend. Students who are at home with iPads and the internet, whose parents expect them to um, wander in the corridors of leading universities in India and abroad, we have them in the hundreds of thousands. Students who are, who are first generation learners, whose parents have never been in a classroom before, whose levels of nutrition and health are so low as could be, and whose prospects of a good life, whichever way you might conceive it, are equally poor, we have them in the millions. What are the chances that we might reasonably articulate the nature of the education that may offer in not too distant a future, a path to a quality of life that the students themselves and the society that they live in can recognize as unequivocally worthwhile? Can this be done in the face of com the complex diversity that I spoke about? The articulation and understanding of such an education it seems to me has to take into account the first two terms in the title. It is clear that the nature, sources and consequences of knowledge will be a key ingredient of any such understanding. These, as we all recognize, are questions as old as the hills. The questions of what constitute knowledge, sorry, questions of what constitutes knowledge and the legitimate basis for knowledge claims have been central concerns in both Indian and Western philosophy. However, it is only after the modernist turn in both philosophy and socio-political history that these concerns began to coincide with the concerns of systematic education of large populations of students. The rise and the startling power and efficacy of science has also become part of the educational debate in ways that we still grapple with. Conceptions of knowledge that have arisen in the wake of these historical changes emphasize notions of evidence, justification, efficacy, truth, and universality. The notion of objective and rational argument that uses impartial evidence is supposedly the hallmark of science and is the normative ideal for much of what is legitimate knowledge. My request to the panel is to examine the notion of knowledge conceived in such terms and its relevance for educational milieu like India's with the diversity of context that I speak of. The conception of knowledge that I alluded to, sketchy as the description might be, raises at least two substantive questions relevant to this discussion. Can the panel throw right light on the possible impact of such conceptions of knowledge and the educational practices that they give rise to on students who come from circumstances of extreme social and economic deprivation. Is it possible that these conceptions serve power, as it were, in ways that are not visible at first glance? The suggestion is that knowledge that is considered important in the modern world and the educational systems that arise within it are not impartial but serve to maintain the systems of domination that are the hallmark of even the superficially democratic polities within which these educational ideas are articulated. I suppose I am asking for reassurance that if educational ideas that highlight knowledge and the practices of thought that underpin it are universal, then they unequivocally serve the interest of humanity irrespective of social and political differences. The related question relevant to this discussion, in my view, is the nature and role of objectivity in this notion of knowledge and the educational processes that draw upon these. How important is epistemic objectivity in the vision of education that we value? 
To the extent that education is also deeply connected to the exploration of value, and value to some or large extent is something that is dependent on the subjective perspectives that people and communities possess, is it not a contradiction then to expect education to provide a foundation in objective inquiry? If such an inquiry is feasible or desirable, then are there ways in which educational processes can facilitate both reasonable inquiry and not dismiss the truths that social and collective perspectives supply? This question, if it is legitimate, brings us to the issues of culture and education. I will desist from any claim to having an acceptable definition of culture. It suffices for my purposes to say that culture can be understood in both a broad frame and a narrow frame. The narrower conceptions often familiar in the references to persons as being cultured or otherwise, or to exemplars a high or low culture. I think that the relevant notion of culture here alludes to the universal tendency of human collectives, and even perhaps the higher primates, to create enduring patterns of structured relationships, artifacts and symbolic systems that govern life. These patterns transcend individual lifetimes and often change only imperceptibly and gradually. Social practices, including education, develop within such cultural universes. It is not merely the transactions of the day-to-day -day that such cultural processes organize and direct, but they seem to also influence and even determine some, if not all, of the knowledge and values possible to the members of these collectives. It is famously, or notoriously, depending on one's point of view, argued that knowledge is not, the, not, not singular and cultural plurality gives rise to a multiplicity of knowledges, each appropriate to the time and space that every community occupies. Education in this context is both a process of cultural reproduction and also a disruptive force. Cultural perspectives grounded in social and religious views can, be both, can both be underwritten and subverted by education. <laughs> It is this power of education that has brought various aspects of the curriculum to the forefront of social and political battles. In the Indian context too, as in many other places, the relationship between culture and education has been associated with the confrontation between religious authority and science, or that between traditional social mores and more, more modern individualistic ones. The project of promoting republican citizenship of autonomous individuals comes up against diverse communitarian claims. It is not clear that liberal education has ideas strong enough to meet the challenge. I hope that the members of the panel will engage with and enlighten us about ways of understanding these issues and avoid some of the seeming dead ends that thoughts such as mine might lead to. The last point that I would like to raise to the panel is a puzzlement about the connection of knowledge and the modes of thinking that lead to it, to the possibility of a good life. It might seem flippant to question the role of knowledge in this manner, but it seems to me that some of the lines of thought alluded to above, carried to their logical end, may suggest that the role of knowledge in thinking may be less central than we may suppose. If communitarian and traditional forms of knowledge or ways of life can lead to peaceful and stable cultures, as some of the narratives of tribal life seem to indicate, what does that tell us about the role of knowledge in a putative universal curriculum? What are, what are we to make of the insinuation that such knowing is parochial in the same way that cultural knowledge is often, often alleged to be? Related to this is the question of the excessive individualism and instrumental rationality of the Western forms, forms of social organization that have emerged in the last few hundred years. Are the so-called developing societies chasing a mirage in hoping that modern education and the notions of knowledge and critical reason that underpin it, conceived in ways that I have perhaps only caricatured, will transplant ways of life now considered primitive and lead to plenitude and peace? I stop here with the hope that I have not exceeded my brief. To my friends in the audience who wonder, 
I should also hasten to add that I cannot possibly hold all these perspective at the same, perspectives at the same time. May I request Professor Phillips to make the next set of remarks? Uh, sorry, uh, Professor David Carr, he will be followed by <coughs> Professor Phillips and then uh, Rohan Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I might add, by the way, to the, the introduction that I was. Um, I retired from Edinburgh University about three years ago, uh, and I thought I'd got away with it. But uh, uh, I, in fact, I've, um, I've just been appointed as uh, Professor of Ethics and Education at the University of Birmingham, so um, they've got me back to work again, which is very disappointing. Um, I'm going to uh, apologise for this in advance. Uh, the first thing is that um, this task was uh, dropped on me at a very late hour. Uh, I didn't realise that this, uh, I wasn't alerted to the fact that this was on the agenda until um, uh, last week and um, I was busy with other things. So what I have to say today is going to be largely off the top of my head. And as far as that goes, um, I have been up for uh, 24 hours. Um, I've come down from, uh, I mean, I know that other people have come from places further away, uh, but I've come from near the Arctic Circle, uh, up in Scotland, and um, conditions were pretty bad up there, and uh, it was touch and go whether I'd get here at all. So it is nice to, to be here and to, to see you. Um, I'm going to make some very general remarks about uh, very general observations, philosophical observations, conceptual observations by and large about the relationship between the three main terms, I suppose, culture, uh, knowledge, and education. The first uh, of these terms, um, as indicated in the introduction, is complex. Uh, for a start, there are different senses of culture. One common sense of culture, we might call this a descriptive sense of culture, is uh, the one that uh, we perhaps find in sociological or anthropological writings uh, when anthropologists or sociologists study a society, either a, a developed or a less well developed society, uh, they will take um, culture to mean by and large uh, the set of practices that go to define that particular society, uh, that particular uh, social constituency. Uh, that will include, by and large, the, uh, the rituals, the religions of uh, that culture. It will uh, refer to their art. It will refer to uh, the kinds of uh, work they engage in. It will refer to um, such things as their cooking, for example. So, uh, culture in this sense is simply descriptive of all of everything that this particular constituency happens to do in their day-to-day -day affairs. Um, this sense of culture obviously has educational implications because there's clearly going to be uh, the, the educational task here is uh, often going to be conceived as the promotion of those kinds of qualities, those kinds of capacities and so on that serve to promote uh, flourishing within that particular society uh, helps them to do the jobs, hunting, fishing, or farming, or whatever it is that that culture needs to do. But I want to move to and concentrate for a little while on quite a different sense of um, culture. And this is one introduced by the 19th century uh, English, uh, mainly known as an English poet. In, in my view, uh, one of the four great poets of the 19th century, um, the others I, for, uh, to my own taste, would include uh, Hardy, Tennyson, and uh, uh, Jared Manley Hopkins, I suppose. Um, but certainly, these, I think, are four great <coughs> poets. Ma the, the fourth is Matthew Arnold. And Matthew Arnold uh, was a as well as being a poet, he earned his living as a school's inspector. So he was very, very interested in education. And very, very interested in culture. And Matthew Arnold actually gives us a, 
uh, another sense of culture, which is, I suppose, more of a normative or evaluative sense of culture, rather than this descriptive one. Uh, famously, Matthew Arnold defines culture as the best that has been thought and said in the world. Okay? So culture is not just a set of any old practices that a society might happen to engage in. Uh, it's what is to be regarded as the, the flower of achievement of a particular culture. And Matthew Arnold locates this in um, various kinds of traditions of thought and inquiry that uh, it's, it's thinking about Western culture here, particularly British culture, uh, the various forms of, uh, of achievement and inquiry that his own culture is engaged in. Uh, it's interesting here that uh, one of the one of the Matthew Arnold's great concerns uh, was to criticise a conception of education. Well, certain moves towards spreading popular education in his day, in the 19th century, um, advanced by uh, utilitarian and, and uh, instrumentalist thinkers. And utilitarians and instrumentalists tended to think of education, look, if we're trying to extend education to the masses, and of course the mass of people in the 19th century, the working classes, didn't receive education, if one's interested in educating the masses, uh, what should we actually give them to learn? And the utilitarian view is essentially that what we should give them to learn were uh, skill, what we should make them learn were skills that were useful, either socially or economically useful. So utility was the, uh, the name of the game. Utility was the hallmark of uh, the, uh, uh, made the current idea century about what should go, uh, what should inform uh, popular education. So, uh, children should be encouraged, students should be encouraged to obviously uh, go to read and write. We have to have a, a, a culture with basic literacy, but also they would need the technical skills that were required to help uh, promote and preserve a, 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 a basically industrial society. Matthew Arnold is very critical of this. Uh, his definition of education is the promotion of culture. And culture is defined as the best that's been thought and said in the world. It's interesting that the, the utilitarians of his day, by and large, tended to emphasize, on, emphasize science and technology, but they, uh, they tended to dismiss the arts and humanities. The arts and humanities weren't of much use. They were simply frills of, of civilized living. But they weren't really important because they weren't the, uh, the types of inquiry, they weren't the areas of knowledge which, as we say in the West, brings home the bacon. Okay? So uh, the utilitarians were interested in that. Matthew Arnold wants to argue that what should be at the center of the curriculum is precisely the arts and humanities. So notice first, Matthew Arnold focuses on, concentrates on, at the centre of education, the arts and humanities. Well, why? Because, in effect, the utilitarians might argue reading Shakespeare, reading poetry, is useless. Uh, why should children need to know history? All they need to do is to know how to operate machines. Why do they need art, history, uh, why do they need uh, music or whatever. Well, Matthew Arnold, of course, was a poet, so he might, might say, well, he would have said that. Um, he was obviously interested in the arts. But clearly, uh, Arnold wants to argue that the arts are terribly important from the point of view of helping us to understand who we are. Uh, reading Shakespeare is not just a matter of entertainment for Matthew Arnold, <coughs> It's a matter of education. Reading Othello, reading King Lear, reading Hamlet can help us to understand something of how human beings tick. That might not be the only reason for reading Shakespeare, to be sure, but nevertheless, uh, we can see that reading Shakespeare has 
some kind of moral content here. Likewise, history. How can we understand ourselves, how can we understand our position in the world without knowing where we came from, without knowing something of our past, about some, knowing something of the influences that have formed us? But Matthew Arnold, again, notice, he's not just saying that we should have art in the curriculum rather than a science. He's saying we should have both. But his reasons for including science and mathematics are very different from the utilitarian reasons for including science and mathematics. Why, then, should we include mathematics? Well, what would a utilitarian say? Let's say that teaching children arithmetic, teaching them mathematics is terribly important because you need to be numerate. You need, for example, to make sure that when you go into shops and pay for something, you're not getting shortchanged. Okay? So it's a way of making sure that you get the right change in shops. This might be one reason for studying mathematics. That wouldn't be Matthew Arnold's view. It's interesting here uh, that Galileo, the great founding father of Western science, or one of the founding fathers of Western science, says somewhere um, that nature is a book written by God in the language of mathematics. Nature is a book written by God in the language of mathematics. Now, whatever that is about, it's not about counting each inch in shops. <laughs> What's Matthew Arnold saying here? He's saying mathematics is a language. It's a way of understanding our world. I'm afraid it's a way of understanding our world that's forever closed to me. But nevertheless, it's clear that higher mathematics is a, a form of conceptualization of the universe. It's a way of conceptualizing the universe. The great founding fathers of modern science found mathematics indispensable from that point of view. And likewise, science, for Matthew Arnold, would not be just a matter of technology, not just a matter of helping us to invent um, certain kinds of devices which help us to live that more, much more comfortably or easily. Science is a way of understanding our world. It's one way of freeing us from the superstitions of received, perhaps some kind of received religious traditions, for example. We no longer believe the witches cause, science teaches us that it's not appropriate to think that witches cause, cause diseases. Sciences can tell us how uh, diseases are caused uh, through empirical inquiry. We can come to objective evidence, which helps us to understand our world that much better. So science, again, is not just a matter of technology, it's a matter of being able to see the world that much more clearly. And uh, clearly, like many other great things in the 19th century, he thought that science was to do that. Matthew Arnold is the founder of a, uh, of a modern founder, because you might want to trace this, these kind of ideas about the value of education uh, right back to the Greeks. For example, uh, what we should emphasize here is Matthew Arnold is not saying, like the utilitarians, that education is of extrinsic worth, of instrumental worth, he's saying it's of intrinsic worth. It's a worth because it helps us, <coughs> it helps us to become certain kinds of people, it helps us to become certain kind of persons who can see our world much more clearly, who are free from superstition, who are free from the uh, oppressing forces of some authority. <coughs> and, uh, of course, the key notion here is the idea of autonomy, because knowledge can help us to be able to act much better in the world, act much more responsibly in the world, think about what we're doing. Matthew Arnold stands at the head of a, the modern, he's the modern founder, I would say, of a tradition of liberal education which extends right through the 20th century. 
it, uh, uh, this tradition, I would say, takes in a wide variety of real, very important cultural figures. I would say it takes in T.S. Eliot, who wrote quite a bit on education, as well as being perhaps the most important poet of the 20th century. It takes in F.R. Lemus, uh, the uh, literary critic. It takes in people like Michael Oakeshott, but it also um, extends, I think, to the founding fathers of modern analytical philosophy of education. And you all have heard names like Richard, Peter, Richard Peters and Paul Hurst. And uh, it seems to me that they're developing, attempting to develop an educational epistemology, a theory of knowledge that is grounded very much in this liberal tradition. And on the Hurst view, um, we need to look at human rationality itself needs to be understood as can only be understood, this is what Hurst tends to say, can only be understood as structured in terms of certain kinds of traditions of thought, each of which is defined by its own particular logic, defined, as Wittgenstein would say, by its own grammar. Uh, 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 one of these forms certainly is science. And Peters and Hurst would want to say very much the same sort of things about science as a Matthew Arnold or a J.S. Mill would. That it's a way of helping us to come to the truth about things. Not the absolute truth, because science is provisional. Um, scientific hypotheses uh, are constantly open to revision. This is what Karl Popper tells us about um, scientific theory. It's not a matter of verification, it's a matter of falsification. But Nevertheless, scientific theories, unlike religious beliefs, one might say, are nevertheless subject to inquiry. They have to, um, they have to submit to certain canons of rational inquiry that are not available elsewhere. But first of course, and Peters do want to say that there can be objective traditions of moral and religious and aesthetic inquiry. Once again, what counts as good or bad in art is not just a matter of how we feel about it, whether we prefer one work of art to another. I, I find this view, by the way, I'm, I must go on too long, but I, I find this view very common among uh, students. Latterly, when I was teaching students in Edinburgh, I used to ask them, well, you know, uh, what do you think is the basis for preferring uh, uh, one, com one musician or composer to another, uh, yeah, for the sake of uh, for the sake of argument, uh, Mozart and Michael Jackson. <laughs> they would say, first, there's no basis whatsoever. It's just a matter of what you happen to prefer. This is not what a Matthew Arnold would want to say. This is not what the Peters would want to say. This is not what I want to say. Okay, and I did that for emphasis. <laughs> <laughs> so, on this view, there are certain standards, there are certain canons of inquiry which help us to develop, to become better kinds of persons, better agents in the world. But then that raises the large question, which is for this panel discussion, of how we know that this conception of objective human inquiry actually does conflict with us traditional sources of formation, those traditional ideas about um, uh, the formation of human personality and so on, of traditional religious communities and so on. Um, are there conflicts here? If there are conflict, conflicts, how can these be resolved without perhaps the destruction of effectively entire cultures? Now, I think they, these, these things can be reconciled but perhaps we can say more about this in the course of the discussion. So that's what I can do for now. Okay? Thanks. I feel like a member of the CIA in my monthly song. Um, I was tempted just to say everything that David said, but say it in my Australian-American accent, which would really give you a change but there's a lot of uh, overlap and agreement between what we're saying. But I'm going to focus uh, on slightly a different uh, 
set of issues, and I first of all want to just check with you. Um, uh, see how many of you have science, or roughly familiar with it. That's good, that's good. Uh, the fewer the better, because then I can keep you interested. Make us uh, one person. Mm. I'll swear you to secrecy. <laughs> and yoga. Okay. These are examples from the US particularly, that all have uh, a lot of significance for the dilemma that was set up uh, when the, the topic was outlined at the outset, which is really the uh, the tension between putting on the curriculum the, the bodies of knowledge that are rationally justified and the things that I would actually call bodies of knowledge versus uh, other things that are believed by traditional groups that are sometimes called knowledge, but uh, I would want to say they're belief systems, but not knowledge. But I'm not going to go into that issue particularly because I'm reading a paper on that on Thursday. So uh, I'll keep you in... Uh, in a state of uh, artificial excitement about my views on that topic. But, um, but there is a tension, obviously, between putting uh, certain things on the curriculum that uh, challenge belief systems of traditional groups uh, who don't want to see these things on the curriculum, want to see something else on the curriculum. And these examples, uh, I think, are very enlightening. But I thought I'd start off uh, just reminding you of John Dewey, the great American philosopher and pragmatist, and he had, uh, had a lot to say. He wrote about 40 books and 800 journal articles in a day without, without Apple computers and iPhones and iPads. Um, but he had this, this image that over here we have what he rather nicely called the founded wisdom of the race. It's all the sort of stuff that's evolved over the course of thousands of years science and music and literature and philosophy and belief systems and medicine, traditional medicine, cooking practices, poetry, founded wisdom of the race. And over here you have the child who comes into the world like a, a, a balloon that has no, nothing in it. And the job of the educator is to take this balloon of the child and move it over and let it expand as it absorbs some of the founded wisdom of the race and each child will expand somewhat differently because their interests are different, their abilities are different. But it's the educator's job to make this, this funded wisdom of the race available to the children in that particular society. And I like this, it sounds rather wonderful, funded wisdom of the race. Uh, I, I like it because it, it doesn't use the word knowledge. There's a tendency for us to think of the curriculum as being bodies of knowledge, physics, chemistry, algebra, or whatever. Um, but Dewey was thinking about uh, those things certainly in a part of the curriculum, but uh, founded wisdom of the race includes lots of other things. It includes the philosophy, the music, the great poetry that's uh, evolved within a particular culture, the cooking systems, uh, the sports that are played, recreational activities and so on. All those are the funded wisdom of the race and our job as educators is to make those available to kids. But also the job doesn't finish when kids reach a certain age, magical age, 16 or 18. Dewey said that education is coterminous with living. So while you're living, you're being educated and your balloon is still increasing. Even Robin Barrows and David Carr and my, my balloons are still getting a little more inflated. <laughs> I'd rather feel that the more wine in my balloon gets inflated in one direction, gets deflated in another direction. <laughs> but uh, that comes when you reach a certain age. But Dewey would say, no, if you're alive, you're still learning, you're becoming educated, you're building on the stocks of knowledge and understanding and beliefs and practices that you've absorbed. And that keeps on going. And when it stops, it means you're dead. And uh, that's a, also a rather interesting view, I think. So, where, where does the conflict come in? 
Well, the content that uh, the we're focusing on comes in when you think of the curriculum as largely being bodies of, of traditional knowledge that have some sort of rational justification built into them, physics and chemistry and mathematics and so on, and uh, they seem to come into conflict with some other cultural beliefs and how do we just make a decision about what goes into the curriculum and what doesn't. And this is where these examples uh, come in. Uh, I didn't know, I've been struggling for two days, uh, partly while sitting for five hours on the tarmac at Heathrow waiting to be de-iced. Um, there's one order to do these in, and there's no rational order at all, so I'll just uh, do them in the order that happen. It's a difficult order, I guess. Uh, creation science is the rival to evolution theory. And uh, the evolutionary theory has had a rather checkered history in the United States. There was a court case in the 1920s, the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, about whether evolution could be taught in American schools. But uh, by and large, of course, it's a center, the theory of evolution is a central plank of modern biology. And it's hard to think of any uh, uh, up-to-date biology course particularly at an intermediate or advanced level, that doesn't have evolutionary theories as uh, overall a uh, sort of binding conceptual basis. But fundamentalist religious groups in America have uh, formulated a rival to uh, evolutionary theories, which is called creation science, and it's based on the account given in the book of Genesis of the Christian Bible, and then the, the the Old Testament, the Jewish Bible as well, I guess. And it's the view that God created the universe in seven days and created the animals on a certain day and the plants on a certain day and so on. And they want, these groups who have wanted to have this creation science at, at least as a minimum taught alongside evolutionary theory in biology courses, but preferably they would like to see it replacing uh, evolutionary theory. And this uh, debate arose about 20 years ago, it became very heated, and it took place largely in Texas, because that's where textbook uh, publishers were, uh, had their base, uh, and uh, the textbook companies had a vested interest in not having to produce one textbook for uh, states in America that were very fundamentalist, and a different textbook with different content for more liberal states. Uh, so I was interested in seeing a winner decided here. And there was a long debate and threatened uh, court cases and so on. But then the uh, philosophers of science in America joined the debate. Um, uh, science educators, uh, philosophers of education joined the debate. And the American Academy of Sciences uh, published a publication with dozens and dozens, it's a rather wonderful uh, little book list, with dozens and dozens of statements by famous philosophers and leading scientists urging that the theory of evolution is a scientific theory because of certain characteristics. It can be potentially refutable, it can, in certain areas, can make predictions and so on. And, and arguing creation science had no place in the biology curriculum. And, uh, as it stands at the moment, the, uh, the scientists' view uh, won out, and creationism is not regarded as part of the biology curriculum. Now, that could be regarded as an epistemological debate, and it is partly. It's about what counts as a science, and it's a perfectly legitimate thing for the leading scientists of a country to take a stand on what ought to be included in a scientific curriculum. But it's also, of course, there's an interest of uh, the religious parents who are concerned that their religious ideology is being threatened by this biology curriculum. And of course, part of the answer is they don't, the children do not have to take biology, but if they want to become uh, doctors or dentists or uh, biological researchers, uh, then of course they have to take biology and they have to learn the theory of evolution because that's a fundamental part of the, uh, the discipline of, of modern biology. But there was a tension there that uh, brought philosophers of education and epistemologists into a debate about what the content of a particular subject is. 
And that seems to me to be right and proper. If you're going to have a debate about what the content of, of economics is, economists presumably ought to have some say, but philosophers and parents and other interested groups also ought to be able to enter into the debate. But in the end, if you're going to learn economics, it ought to be the economics that economists actually um, agree or to be taught. Uh, I personally don't think very much of why the economics. Uh, I agree it's the dismal science. But if you want to teach it, if it's going to be economics, it ought to be the economics that, he, that the great economists uh, would recognize being part of their discipline. So that's part of the answer. But of course, economics and biology are not the totality of the curriculum. There are lots of this other funded wisdom of the race that goes into the curriculum that have nothing to do with knowledge, but of social practices, mores, belief systems, and so on. Um, MACOS. It's an acronym stands for Man, a Course of Study. And it was a curriculum that was developed by Jerome Bruno initially, a great Harvard psychologist in America, and it was uh, aimed at secondary schools uh, in social studies. And it was very, very enlightened in, in regard to the uh, teaching methods that we used. It was an inquiry-based uh, system. The kids got packets of information and had to do research on certain topics and form discussion groups and go to the library. There were film strips and uh, lots of material photographs of the original documents and so on. But the um, but the guiding principle was to get kids doing social studies to understand that a functioning social system or a cultural group, one of the examples that was used in the curriculum was the Inuit, an Eskimo tribe in northern Alaska. Um, a cultural group is living in a hostile environment and, and adopts certain practices and certain belief systems uh, in order to, to foster its survival in what is often a threatening environment. And the Inuit happen to have a practice where elderly people are asked to go outside into the snow and uh, freeze to death. And uh, part of the justification for this is they're making a sacrifice to save food so the rest of the group will survive in winter. And uh, but, so the Inuit are studied, this, this practice is studied, and, and debated and so on, but also their, their eating habits, their cookery habits, their belief system, their religion, their views about the nature of the physical universe around them, the animal population that they have to hunt for food and so on. And so the system, the, the, the society is looked at as a functioning system and the, and the parts within it are judged to be what are the elements of this system that help it survive and, and so on. But the course was meant to be non-judgmental. The, 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 the course did not take a stand and say, sending uh, grandparents out to freeze to death in the middle of the winter when everyone's starving is a good thing, and didn't say it's a bad thing. It left that up for, for further inquiry and debate among the kids. But it was offered just as an example of uh, how to look at a social system and look at its various, the fund wisdom of that society and uh, the trade-offs that are made and so on. So you have a sense that you understand the society uh, before you, you judge it, you have to be able to understand it. Uh, well, this was uh, based on current anthropology, psychology, social psychology and so on. And you might say it's an example of the curriculum that was developed by positivistic type science. I wouldn't say that, but some of you might want to say that. But it's certainly an up-to-date social science-based curriculum. It was uh, uh, born in controversy from the moment the ink was dry on the textbooks. And particularly, the people who were against it were fundamental Christian groups who were objected to the fact that, that um, the, the ethical practices of, this, of these groups were, were treated as being, uh, uh, on the face of it, as good as the practices uh, and beliefs of fundamentalist Christians. And they wanted, a, they wanted social science curriculum that out and out rejected any belief system that was not compatible with the first uh, books of the Bible, the Christian Bible. 
And there was an, an old, old mighty fuss about this, and eventually that group won, and the books were withdrawn. And, and uh, so Macross was, well, was a wonderful, wonderful curriculum, and the, the, uh, just the educational technology involved was, was, was decades ahead of its time, uh, is not, not actually used anymore. So that's an example. And what, what I'm suggesting here, and it will come here in the, in the third example, is that the choice of what goes into the curriculum might in part be an epistemological question or philosophical question. That's certainly one of the things you have to think about in deciding what will be taught. But it's basically, deep down, more a political issue. And these issues are politicized because what goes into the curriculum affects the lives of groups, and particularly minority groups in society, and the United States, and Great Britain, and Australia, and India, are multicultural, pluralistic democracies. And different groups within our societies have different interests. And the school curriculum, the school curriculum is a site where these interests meet and clash. And uh, you might say, well, we could deal with that by getting philosophers to be kings again, as they were once in Plato's Republic, and philosophers can settle this and arbitrate what ought to be taught. But there's another way of dealing with it to say, let the political process deal with it. Let's see if it can choose wins and losers. Let's see if a reasonable balance can be, can be achieved. Um, and certainly in America, anyway, that's the situation that, that's happened with uh, not altogether rosy results, I'm afraid. But, uh, so, you have this political clash, and Yoda, the full title of it is Wisconsin versus Yoda, and the state of Wisconsin versus uh, this uh, small Amish group, three families led by a, a, a farmer named Mr. Yoda, and um, they took the, the, the state of Wisconsin to court on the grounds that if their children are forced to go to secondary school beyond about eighth grade, remember uh, compulsory attendance up to usually about 11th or 12th grade was required. This was not, not many years ago, in the 70s. Um, if their children are forced to go to, to school beyond the, basically the elementary grades, it would destroy their religion. Because what they're going to get in secondary school, the liberal disciplines of biology, history, civics, mathematics, chemistry, and so on. These were going to destroy their, their religion, and they were a very tight, tight religious community, uh, very family-oriented, and the children who rejected the religion and the, the way of life of the Amish uh, were uh, asked to leave the community, and they, they were shunned, and the families didn't have any, 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 any interaction with them at all after that. So a very tight-knit community, and so they sued the state of Wisconsin um, to uh, say that children should be exempt from compulsory attendance laws in school, and they won. And uh, the state of Wisconsin sued them to the Supreme Court of the U.S., and uh, the Supreme Court um, voted, and voted unanimously that uh, the uh, Amish families had a right to remove their children from education because their education was going to undermine their traditional religious and social and ethical values. Um, only one justice, although he voted, Judge Justice Douglas, voted with the majority, so he agreed that Yoda won, but he issued a, a slight um, sort of warning that he was troubled by one thing. And the thing he was troubled about, he said the court had argued the rights of the state to legislate the content of education, that was part of what was going on, of course, uh, versus the right of the, of the parents to have their children educated the way they wanted to. And Justice Douglas, in a very um, uh, foresighted manner, I guess, uh, said the thing that troubled him was the interest of the children weren't talked about in this decision. And the rest of the court said, no, they won't talk about it, because that wasn't what was issued. The issue was the parents versus the state. But his concern was, what about the rights of the children to have an education that would make them autonomous, 
make them independent thinkers and so on. And that is roughly where the, the state of debate has been ever since. Uh, philosophers of social science, political theorists, uh, and um, quite a large group within the philosophy education community have hotly debated the Yoda decision, but largely in terms of the rights of the children. If we want the children to grow up to make a decision, not that we want them to, to reject their religion, but they shouldn't be able to make a thoughtful decision as to whether they want to continue the Amish way of life or not, then you have to give them the resources. In Dewey's terms, you have to make a valuable the funded wisdom of the race so that they can become critical thinkers and appreciate and, and, and uh, evaluate social practices and so on. And they should be able to make decisions for themselves. We should have the interest of the children at heart. And the, the debate goes on, but also parents, of course, have some interest in what happens to their children. And the state has a decided interest in what, what it wants its citizens to be. Do we want our citizens to be ignorant? Or do we want them to be well educated? Do we want them to be critical thinkers? Do we want them to be up to date with uh, some knowledge and understanding of history, of science? Think of all the political issues that are involving the environment and science at the moment. We want them to be able to, be, uh, able to make informed decisions about these things. So it's a very complicated situation, but it seems to me to nicely illustrate the view that um, making a decision about what you teach is not entirely, I think, as an epistemologist, I like to think that the possible epistemology is, is the king. It's everywhere. But unfortunately, it's not. It's one factor that's involved. It's involved in patient science versus evolution. Uh, it's involved probably in, the, in these other areas as well to some degree. But largely, the, the curriculum is an arena where groups within our society struggle for political influence, struggle to preserve what they think is right, and in a democracy, groups have the right to struggle for what they think is right. And, uh, but that makes a very untidy world in which you guys are going to enter and practice your careers for the next 50 or 60 years. So, uh, good luck. <laughs> that I have 10 minutes, therefore I have to narrow down the topic. What I told Venu initially was not that I'm going to correct the topic, I said that I'm going to narrow it down, because there is limited time. Uh, also, I have another reason, two reasons to narrow it down. Because uh, when, the, when we started formulating this idea, this was a tension between, uh, say, standard epistemology and culturally rooted notions of knowledge, culturally and subjective, uh, you know, taking on more subjectivity. And then uh, it went from uh, culturally rooted uh, uh, knowledge to culture and knowledge and education, and then it seems to me that the balloon is expanding. Uh, since the time is very limited with me and I have nothing very profound to say, therefore I am coming back to that uh, original topic. I also feel that uh, uh, the real problem, the crux of the matter, uh, is not really in the educational theory. Uh, educational theory has room for all kinds of cultural wisdom, and uh, perhaps there is no really uh, very adversarial kind of debate about it. Nor is the debate about meaning making in general. Meaning making, to my mind, is much more general than the claim of knowledge. The real crux of the matter, to my mind, and what uh, Dennis was just now giving examples, the real crux of the matter is claims of knowledge, which is a small area of total meaning, human meaning making, and uh, objectivity on one side, or rational grounds on one side, and culturally rooted or subjective grounds on the other side. And there is no reason to believe that culturally, that the objective grounds are not culturally rooted. Therefore, the distinction perhaps is being made, those culturally rooted uh, grounds for knowledge which cannot be rationally justified. So that sounds a bit strange, but I'm not accusing uh, that. But th that uh, so that is one thing that I'm going to narrow down the topic to, uh, the original set. The second thing is that I'm taking uh, 
Uh, second point I want to make is that I will, go, uh, I will try to pose the problem from the opposite direction. At this moment, most, in most of the literature, the problem is posed as if trying to find objective and rational grounds for knowledge is an oppressive act on certain kinds of uh, culturally accepted knowledge and this is uh, uh, oppressive excludes those forms of knowledge and therefore this needs to be corrected. And this is assumed that culturally accepted knowledge which takes subjectivity on board is innocent. I have serious doubts whether culturally accepted knowledge without any kind of uh, objective grounds is innocent that may turn out to be more oppressive and perhaps is more oppressive. If I explain on this point a little bit, then it seems to me that uh, when we form our beliefs without uh, reflection or pre-reflection beliefs, then maybe they are abstracted from the cultural social practices or they are taken from the authority or uh, from the common fund of, of knowledge around us. It seems that there could be at least four possible uh, problems with these kinds of views or they might face, I'm not saying that they will always face, but they might face four possible kinds of problems. One is many of such views actually may come in conflict with real experience. For example, a very much culturally accepted view uh, in uh, uh, Rajasthan at time one time was that smallpox is caused by some sort of uh, divine displeasure on you, and there was also a particular divinity uh, which uh, with which the smallpox was associated. And smallpox could be avoided by certain kinds of social practices, and you did those things and still you were smallpox. So this might come into the conflict uh, with with actual experience. The second thing is that as soon as you form any beliefs and you start uh, thinking about implications of your belief for your action and making choices, then the idea of consistency and coherence between those belief systems becomes very important for them. You don't need the outside epistemology to come into a certain culture to see these conflicts. They will arise within the same culture. Therefore, how does one resolve these conflicts? It seems to me that this is impossible without having some sort of demand for justification and objectivity. If people want to interact with each other, if people want to collaborate with each other, then some sort of objectivity, which means that everything doesn't depend on my own mind, but I can actually communicate to the another person and we might find something common worthwhile on acting upon. So, minimum definition if we do, this is not objectivity as such, but expanding from my own mind to other minds that becomes necessary. Therefore, justification and objective justification, uh, it seems, cannot be avoided as far as notions in principle is concerned. But perhaps the problem is not about the notions of uh, objective justification, but what substance you put in what you consider justified and what you consider, ob consider objective and what you don't consider objective. So at least one part we can perhaps accept without much uh, violence to culturally rooted ideas that even within the cultures or in, in whatever kind of, if you call something knowledge and distinguish it from belief, then you have to have some sort of distinguishing criteria and perhaps justification and objectivity will have to be among them. Now the second thing is that that takes us strange if we think that education is to do anything with finding one's place or creating one's place in a society and develop capabilities uh, for autonomous decision in a, in, a, in a society. Then education can hardly avoid uh, uh, knowledge and hardly avoid having some sort of criteria what kind, what kind of cultural knowledge it is going to take on board. So I, what I'm trying to say is that then ed education has to engage with epistemology and perhaps these kinds of justification and objectivity. 
it seems to me that if one really wants to see, uh, one really wants to root uh, one's, uh, uh, one's justification or knowledge, then perhaps mm, two kinds of sources stand out. Uh, there might be more, but two stand out very clearly. One is human experience and another is capability of human mind to construct coherence in belief systems. And anything uh, which goes against either both or either of them uh, perhaps has to uh, be suspect. And this is not necessary uh, that some other kind of belief systems are coming in a culture. I, I, it seems to me that even within Indian culture, if you take Nai philosophy and uh, the four sources of Nai, uh, knowledge in Nai, they, that kind of epistemology will also come into conflict with many of these kinds of culture, beliefs within this culture. Uh, therefore, it seems to me that actually formulating objective criteria rather than being an oppressive act it's actually emancipatory because if there is no criteria at all then whoever is more powerful in that society or culture if this is subjective and there is there isn't any criteria that kind of view is going to prevail and there is nothing to resist that view objective criteria perhaps gives you a, a, a possible way of resisting this kinds of oppressive view. My time is more or less up. I had a few more things to say, but uh, I'll very quickly select out of them because uh, there must be some time for you also. Uh, two, two small things, uh, and very quickly, in spite of danger that I might be misunderstood. It seems to me that part of the problem uh, arises out of considering all human knowledge as one and generalization. Uh, which, which actually don't go very far. For example, maybe in mathematics and science, this is, there is greater possibility of finding uh, objective criteria and for the agreement and even the universality. Because they are much more directly linked uh, with human experience and uh, internal coherence of ideas. And maybe in social sciences, uh, this is much more complex and therefore much more difficult uh, to do the same. Now a scientist might get up and say, I will consider knowledge only that which passes my criteria and therefore social sciences knowledge which cannot meet those criteria uh, perhaps uh, is at a disadvantage. A social scientist might consider something knowledge and uh, might see that there is a lot of cultural element in this and then might get up and say that all knowledge is like that. It seems to me that both have a tendency of undue generalization and part of the problem is arising from there. So if we recognize that different aspects or different uh, what Hurst calls uh, forms of knowledge, different forms of knowledge might uh, actually have the possibility of different degree of accuracy, objectivity, uh, but all are rooted in a rational traditional tradition. Those rational traditions might be of different nature uh, for, for different kinds of knowledge. Uh, another thing I would like to say that uh, if one looks from this angle, then the problem, it seems, as Dennis said, part of the problem is political, actually. And the remaining part of the problem is perhaps pedagogical. Uh, no one ever claims that curriculum could be decided purely on the epistemic grounds. I think the claim usually is that epistemic grounds are necessary to be considered in decision of the curriculum, together with several other grounds. But the pedagogical problem still remains. The child who comes to you in the school, uh, if your curriculum is actually uh, pushing towards a certain kind of rational inquiry, the child might come from a socio-cultural milieu uh, with certain kinds of beliefs and the child's belief system and your curricular belief system might be in the conflict. Therefore, how to negotiate uh, from whatever kind of belief system the child brings to the school to a more reasonable, if not totally rational, 
inquiry and then tradition, that seems to be uh, uh, the crux of the matter. Uh, but since the time is up, and therefore I'll stop here, and since we are here, so maybe later on we can talk about this. Thank you. from the audience. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to invite each of the uh, panelists to make uh, brief interventions uh, both to extend what they have said earlier and uh, if they have some comments on what the other panelists have said. So I, I'll, I'll request uh, David to speak first and uh, maybe one question that came to my mind uh, when you talked about Matthew Arnold was we have we have poets like Tagore who have uh, enunciated a certain vision of education uh, and, and such rich conceptions still leave us in the dark about how to reconcile um, uh, you know, contradicting uh, perceptions of what is good education and what is a good life uh, and leaving it at that uh, leaves all of us in a fairly intense state of discomfort. Can you relieve that a bit? <laughs> Basically no. But um, uh, all this is immensely interesting, and, and I think actually the three presentations were in the right order. Um, I, I think that um, clearly, clearly, all of the key terms in this uh, this discourse, uh, culture, education, and uh, knowledge, are problematic. Um, and it, it's it's emerging that one of the most problematic aspects, because basically from um, uh, Dennis's talk, but also to uh, one of the really problematic terms is the term knowledge. Um, and it's, it's uh, particularly when we, we talk about um, objective knowledge. And um, I, I mean, I share some of um, I share some of Dennis's, uh, I suppose, pragmatist res reservations about um, the use of the term knowledge itself. I mean, it, 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 it's misleading. If, uh, if, if it encourages us to think of think of knowledge in a very undewian way as some kind of set of logically structured propositions which are fixed and final and uh, not open to the vision and so on. Um, so clearly we need to uh, we need to think of the, the idea of knowledge in a much more generous way than that. Um, but it, it still seems to me that there is something um, something right about the um, perhaps even the, the Hurstian idea of, of forms of knowledge, if we, if we conceive of it in terms of precisely um, different sort of grammars of discourse, different kinds of uh, logics of inquiry. There are different kinds of inquiry in human affairs that, uh, that are subject to different canons of, um, of adjudication or evaluation and so on, um, uh, which are, are, are to a great degree uh, tried and tested um, in, in a number of fields. Um, I, uh, I, I, I suspect when I was, I read this, uh, the, this paper several times, the paper that was, that was issued to us, and it seemed to me that what was at the back of, uh, what, what was precisely at the back of, uh, of this um, discourse, what was behind it all, was probably the problems of teaching, um, teaching something like objective canons of um, uh, uh, rational scientific uh, inquiry in, in certain very traditional cultures which have been shaped by other kinds of values have been shaped in a very different kind of way. Um, that's not a, that, that wouldn't be a problem just for India. I mean it's always been a problem I think for most, for most cultures. It's still a problem in the West as Dennis's examples have um, eloquently shown us. I'm somebody who takes uh, religion very seriously. I'm very interested in it. Uh, I've written a lot on it. Uh, some of us here today are um, Hindus, I imagine. Uh, some of us are Christians. Um, I'm one of those, I'm not going to tell you which. But um, it seems to me that, um, I, I was reminded here, I was, I was saying this to, um, to Richard Pring earlier, that um, I was recalling a remark in um, uh, C.S. Lewis, the famous author of the, uh, probably known as well here as he is in the West, uh, the, the author of the Narnia stories. So on. Uh, in his uh, theological writing somewhere, uh, C.S. Lewis says, look, if anybody's thinking of becoming a religious person, there are only two religions worth taking seriously. One is Christianity and the other is Hinduism. 
And um, he's less respectful, I won't say what he says about Islam and um, Buddhism, but he's less respectful. Um, he thinks that there is a, there is, he seems to think that there is a certain grammar, a common grammar of theological discourse in the case of Christianity. They're both incarnational theologies, for example. They're both, in a sense, uh, if we want to construe it in this kind of way, they're both Trinitarian theologies. Um, uh, Lewis seems to think that this, this is a way of making sense of our ideas of God. Okay? Um, I think there's a good deal in this. Um, but what is clear, above all, is that um, uh, prove, uh, talking about God, or uh, talking about the existence of God, is not going to be settled by empirical tests. Okay? It's a different sort of discourse. It's a different form of inquiry. Um, and I think this is the problem, of course, with the, uh, the kind of examples that uh, the, the Dennis talks about here. The problem about, um, about uh, creationists, with creationists, and probably the evolutionists who oppose them, is that they are both, uh, they are both committing the same logical error of thinking that, um, that the books of the Bible, Genesis, for example, is a, is a competing form of scientific theory, which, of course, it isn't. Um, so, uh, one of the problems here is, is fundamentalism. By the way, there are different kinds of fundamentalists, uh, fundamentalists, and they're both bad. There are atheist fundamentalists, as well as religious fundamentalists, and they've both got it wrong. Okay. Um, so, one of the things that... Uh, one of the ways in which we need to reconcile, try to, if we're trying to reconcile, um, one, of, one of the problems with the term knowledge actually is the influence of empiricism, it seems to be. Um, empiricism has, has, has commandeered the term knowledge, has commandeered the, uh, uh, the very idea of knowledge, and has tied it to a particular kind of inquiry. And so if if a human a form of human discourse does not conform to that kind of inquiry, then it is dismissed as nonsense. And I think that's an immense mistake. Um, and I think seeing that is the beginnings of wisdom in reconciling the great insights of traditional cultures shaped by traditional religions and modern, uh, more recent forms of um, of uh, a human inquiry that have worked so well in the physical sciences and elsewhere. They might work well in the physical sciences, but they don't work for every kind of human experience and everything, every, uh, particularly spiritual experiences and moral experiences. They can't account for that. Uh, we need to account for it in some other way. Maybe the term knowledge is not the right one, but nevertheless, to recognize that there are these different grounds, I think, is important. Uh, I have a question for Dennis. Uh, in, in describing these uh, contestations about what should go into the curriculum, uh, could you also talk about uh, a risk coming from the other side of scientism um, and, and, and how scientism, or it might be that some of the reactions to uh, what is seen as science in the curriculum uh, is a reaction to scientism and uh, it's a reaction of people who want to preserve um, forms of life uh, and living uh, rather than uh, acquire certain forms of knowledge. Um, well one, one point that's relevant to this that I neglected to, uh, to, to say when I was talking about Dewey, it's rather hard to say uh, anything comprehensive about a man who wrote 40 books and 800 journal articles, but um, he also started off his uh, great book, Democracy and Education, in 1916, by making a rather uh, obvious point, but, but nevertheless very important point, that education is the process by which societies renew themselves. He said, uh, in, in, in so many years' time I won't be here, in so many years' time you won't be here, but our society presumably will continue on. How is that possible? It's because the valuable things that we have achieved up to now are passed on to the future generation. And then education is, has to be backed off and sort of seen from that perspective. And this is a process by which we pass on things that are valuable. And then that ties into my argument that certainly uh, rational, justified forms of knowledge, rather than necessarily belief, 
are parts of the things we wanted to pass on to the future generation, the bodies of science and history and, and so on that we've, uh, we've developed, but also we want to pass on our great literature, our works of music, our great works of art. And I don't see these as being uh, forms of knowledge. Uh, so it's interesting that Hearst had some trouble about art and literature, and he actually, at one stage, instead of saying knowledge, uh, uh, literature is a form of knowledge in the curriculum, he's reduced to saying literary criticism and art criticism. They're, they're forms of knowledge because they, that's where you get evidence and you make claims and you justify and you test your claims. A literary theorist does, does all of that. But a, but a novelist is writing a novel which is giving insight into some human problems or other, and there's not a question of uh, whether this novelist is producing justified true belief. That is being scientific. And so uh, I think Dewey's view is we pass on things that are valuable, uh, and that the curriculum is more than simply the, 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 uh, the justified forms of, uh, of knowledge that we've developed, but they're very important parts. What has happened in recent years in many countries, I don't know whether the situation is the same in India, but with growing economic pressures, the curriculum has been truncated. In the US, well, when I was at the school in Australia, and I presume the same was true of kids of my age in the United States at the time, I did about eight or nine subjects within the course of a year. Uh, English, English literature, art, history, math one, math two, science, biology, and a whole sway of things. Um, nowadays in America, it is pretty much the, the standard that students do at the most five subjects because there isn't the money to pay teachers to teach longer school days, uh, the resources aren't available, we don't have the trained teachers, and so which things get cut out. Well, of course, art has gone in many places, um, music, things of that sort, um, and what has left are subjects which it's argued are helpful to the economic development of society, which of course many of us, and I think almost unanimously in the philosophy of ed community, would regard that as uh, not an kind of education as a, a concept of education at all. It's uh, looking uh, very me mechanistically at uh, schooling and asking what can we give the kids that will help economic development and make schooling and teaching uh, an adjunct to economic development. But when we're thinking of education, we're thinking of uh, much more broadly. And so there is a tendency for scientism to win out, but it's uh, in what, what gets thrown out of the curriculum. And again, it hasn't been philosophers who made the decision, or for philosophers who are positivists, or philosophers who are uh, anti-positivists, or whatever. It's uh, simply uh, economic forces that have driven this, this, these decisions, and uh, we have to uh, fight against that, but um, I'm uh, rather, rather pessimistic, actually, because uh, most uh, educational decision makers at that level I've spoken to, and was probably about two, uh, were not interested in philosophy at all, and uh, one of them, as I tell the story on a Thursday morning, when uh, asked to talk about epistemology, had to go and look up what the word meant and came back and said she still didn't understand it. So uh, the hope of those people making enlightened philosophical decisions about what ought to be taught um, is pretty remote, I think. I pass the mic to uh, Rohit. See, if I think there's a tension between uh, narrowing down the theme of the discussion to uh, the possibility of getting outside of uh, objective justification and looking at edu education in the broad sense in which David was talking about. We have to come together somewhere. Uh, and and uh, so my question to Rohit is, uh, having to knock down a straw man in the sense that a very diminished idea of what uh, uh, rationality and justification can do. For instance, uh, what you call subjective uh, forms of uh, understanding. Um, it's, it's one thing to have epistemic subjectivity, it, it's another, uh, or uh, to a large extent people's experience is formed of, uh, or there is a significant place for uh, things which are ontologically subjective in the sense that they are, uh, they, they are about entities such as uh, uh, 
which are fundamentally subjective. And do you really have an objective position from any of these uh, can be critiqued. And uh, how, how, because the moment you stand outside of these practices, uh, you've lost some of it, right? Uh, you have no position to critique these from, so they have to be criticized or understood from within and have to follow their rules. And you really do not have a, a rational, objective way of standing outside of these practices. Uh, religion is an example, and, and, and then uh, bring them into the area of education. I do not know whether I can take as much time in answer as the question took, uh, but, I, but I'll try to uh, do it in less time maybe. Uh, this narrowing down was, as I said, because of two reasons, that in 10 minutes if one wants to talk about the entire gamut of uh, culture and knowledge and want to say something which might be meaningful to the audience, that's a huge kind of thing which I'm not able to do. So, whatever narrow or little thing one could say. Um, about uh, 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 this uh, uh, rational justification and uh, uh, Hastian forms of knowledge, actually uh, the idea uh, I was giving was not exactly using the Hastian forms of knowledge, but one taking one important lesson from there, that human knowledge might have different kinds of forms of knowledge, which actually uh, different streams might admit different kinds of what David said, grammar or has to call um, uh, justificatory criteria or validation procedures, uh, etc. And I think that's a worthwhile investigation uh, idea. If one wants to talk about uh, um, uh, uh, religious experience also, then perhaps there has to be, if, if I want to share religious experience, what the kind of religious experiences I have with someone else, then I have to find some common ground that I can communicate that to the another person. If I say that this is totally, absolutely subjective, then I do not know how can I talk about that and I do not know why should I talk about it. I don't even know what gives me right to talk and inflict it on the other person. So unless you think there is a possibility, at least in principle, that what I am saying will make some sense to the another person, without that, there doesn't seem to be any 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 reason uh, apart from saying, okay, I am a realized person, and you listen to it and keep mum. So I do not know when we are talking of subjectivity, even in religion, if we want to. But there are two kinds of things actually. I wasn't actually discarding subjective experience. I, I do think that our, uh, our personal life actually is rich because of subjective experiences. And uh, perhaps no one has uh, any reason to uh, sort of object people's capability to have uh, very, very rich subjective experiences through art or through um, various kinds of other forms as well as religious uh, kinds of practices and, and, and several other things. But when the religious practices uh, graduate from there, enriching my personal life, to get into the public discourse and start saying that others should also do the similar thing or others should also live the similar kind of life. I think that's the time when the question for subjectivity, uh, for objectivity and rational justification arises. The issue of rational justification does not arise uh, as long as uh, this is subjective to, you know, to me alone. Uh, beyond that, I believe uh, other kind of, uh, of subjective experiences uh, Again, we don't have time to get uh, um, uh, get into that. I would also like to comment a little bit about this, that uh, as Denis said, that a noble which gives insight into human life does have knowledge. Of course it does. But perhaps the kind of insight a noble gives that comes from a mixture of uh, um, a very rich aesthetic experience and there is something in that which is saying something about very close to the social science knowledge. And this one, one aspect of it is representation and connecting with people's emotion. And another aspect of it is some sort of uh, depicting or pointing out or at least hinting at some social reality. The second part, the social reality, 
actually could be investigated rationally. And the first part, of course, is a subjective experience. Uh, but again, we are using forms uh, of, of symbolism uh, which are actually go beyond one person. Then only this experience could be aroused in the other mind. So I'll stop there. We'll open up for questions. I'm afraid we do not have too much time. Uh, person as far as education is concerned, so my question could be a little bit stupid. But what I wanted to say, a fascinating discussion, but one topic didn't come up explicitly, which is the notion of power. And the fact that the education process is hardly completely uh, rational discourse. And what's really going on is a social process of, of socialization, basically. And why this entire problem is coming up is that different kinds of people are being socialized. And as we are becoming a global society, a bigger society, more and more people need to be brought into that network. So, so therefore, the idiom that's coming up is what kind of things become important in that general thing. You may not like it, I don't like it. But the fact of the matter is that if we're deciding what should be included and what should not be included, What's actually de facto happening is what it will, what are the things that are required to socialize these people from an other into that process. So that aspect, I think, has to be discussed, and it cannot be discussed only in that point. The second point that I wanted to make was that there is obviously a process of dominance going on. I mean, in every single discipline, and with more. So uh, what what really has to be fought against? is the attitude of dismissal of, of viewpoints or approaches which are different from what I am socializing. So it's like a common currency. So the dollar is driving out the rupee or... Uh, so, so that's the problem. I mean, uh, there is an elevation of science, quote unquote, a particular thing, in a particular time in history. You came, come to India about uh, uh, 100 years ago, science would be nowhere and, and, and you know, literature and other things would be much, much higher. And, so what's actually happening is, it's not just uh, uh, fashion, there is a social representation of power which is elevating certain things. Today, in an engineer-dominated, science-dominated culture, certain kinds of things are getting the same. So I think that at some level, this uh, how do we make this process democratic? How do we make the people acknowledge those things that are not our way of thinking? That's a crucial issue I want that, sir. Perhaps we should have uh, one or two more questions and then the panel can respond. Uh, and, and, uh, and please keep the questions very brief so that the more questions can be asked. This analysis, certain categories regarding the forms of knowledge were used science, 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 being scientific, being scientific in two different categories in a sense, social science, uh, and uh, when. Uh, uh, the first speaker spoke, uh, you know, uh, Professor Carr, speaking about Matthew Arnold, he invoked the category humanities, which I think is a very, very significant category. But somewhere, I think, in the discussion, the fine distinction between social science and humanities got lost, and the two got conflated. And I would uh, request at least some of the panelists to remark on that. I, that was an interesting discussion, and I admire you for keeping awake, despite the fact that you haven't slept for 24 hours or more. I, I was um, reminded of Ams Kassir's work, in which he discusses these questions as well, in relation to the phenomenology of knowledge. And he maintains that there is not an incomprehensible position between art, the aesthetics and science. He said, on the one hand, science gives us knowledge of the. Oh, what happened? Did I turn this off? No, that's what you think I'm doing. No, I don't know how it's. That, uh, which I, I, I haven't read much of Casira's work, but it, it sounds on the face of it to, uh, to in, inclined to a rather uh, aesthetic formalist, or a you know, formalist account of his aesthetics, uh, which, which precisely would make a sharp distinction between form and content of works of art that I don't want to make, personally. Uh, 
I think that um, um, works of art, I'm a pluralist about the value of works of art, by the way, an educational pluralist. I think that works of art just don't do one thing in the school curriculum. I think they do lots of things. I think they have aesthetic value, um, entertainment value, but I also think they have moral value. Some works of art have moral value. Not all works of art have moral value. A Jackson Pollock painting doesn't have any moral content. But a Dickens novel does. And it, it's part of the purpose of uh, a Dickens novel, actually, to, uh, to give us insight into, uh, well, uh, for at one level, the uh, deplorable conditions of the working class in Victorian London at the time, but at another level to, to give us insight into human relationships, into human character and so on. So I want to say that um, uh, both science and art give us knowledge, okay, but they give us different sorts of knowledge about different aspects of human experience. And uh, uh, I think the distinction between, by the way, social science and the humanities Arts and the humanities has been lost in many places. Yes, that's, what, that's, that's exactly what I said, and I think yes. we need to recreate that distinction. It's a very important right. distinction, yes. isn't it? I think that is an important distinction, but I don't want to hog the microphone. Can I take you? I don't want to hog the microphone, so I'll go. <laughs> um, uh, the, the question of power is, of course, very vexing and very complicated, and I haven't. Uh, been thinking about it for more than several decades, so it's, uh, I still don't quite understand all the issues. But um, there was a time in my life when I rather favoured the neo-Marxist sort of view, Michael Apple and other curriculum theorists, that uh, the curriculum is dominated by uh, the rich and powerful in society and they teach what's in their economic interest and uh, they control other people who uh, and, uh, impose uh, false consciousness on and so on and so forth. But uh, again, I look at the recent experience in the United States, and if you have a society where minority groups uh, may not be in, in fact encouraged very much with money and, and other rewards, but at least are allowed to, um, to get together and to canvas for things that they think are desirable, you get in a really interesting, uh, sort of complex phenomenon develop. So uh, in the part of the world where Valerie and I live, in the Mountain View, home of Google, and Palo Alto, home of Stanford and Hewlett Packard, the schools are very plush, and uh, presumably the kids there are getting things that uh, the rich and powerful want them to get because they're their parents are the rich and powerful. And, uh, and that determines the curriculum, and the curriculum is locally controlled to some degree in the United States. But also, the school systems have evolved a system whereby uh, kids at the higher levels of the school can go to local community colleges and state universities and do university courses while they're still high school students, and they get high school credit, but if they also can count it towards their first year of university. And so, um, kids are are able to take courses more than just what's being imposed on them or what's available in a high school. If the high school doesn't teach philosophy, uh, they can take philosophy courses at the local community college or the local state university and count that towards their high school graduation. So the, in, even in rich and powerful areas, things are a little more complicated. Then you go to Alabama. I've never been to Alabama. I never hoped to go to Alabama. But if you go to Alabama, um, I think you find there that probably gun maintenance, uh, handgun and hand grenade uh, uh, preparation is probably on the curriculum because uh, the society is incredibly redneck and uh, very fundamentalist in orientation. They see conspirators everywhere. They see uh, Barack Obama as a communist. And, uh, and there, and because the education is locally controlled largely, um, that's reflected in the school curriculum. In many textbooks in the, st in the southern states, uh, the, the uh, civil war is not the civil war. It's uh, either the war between the states, if they're being polite, but more usually it's called the war of northern aggression. Uh, so uh, parents there are exercising their power. So it's not a unitary picture of, uh, of uh, Bill Gates or some... Uh, um, sort of vague, uh, out-of-focus, rich person who's controlling the curriculum in the U.S. because
because of the nature of the system, there are something like 3,000 school districts, each with some degree of autonomy. Uh, power is certainly important, but it's a very complicated picture. Um, not, not very reassuring, I get very depressed about it, but, but on the other hand, it uh, strikes me in a democracy, there's uh, some, something to be said for it. Dennis, would you tell people what they call George Washington? What do they call George Washington now? A proto communist. Oh, right, well, a lot of revisionist history going on. Uh, last uh, two questions, perhaps. I have the utilitarian aims of education. Uh, I was saying I couldn't quite understand the juxtaposition of the utilitarian aims of education, the instrumental aims, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the idea of exploration of self or unknowledge, understanding of self or Western culture. Because even the understanding of self or of nature, presumably, is with an instrumental goal. It could be happiness or, or, or peace. But, but it also has an instrumental goal, maybe a different type of instrumental goal. And linked to that is actually that, that some of the most uh, utilitarian or instrumental disciplines, such as economics, um, perhaps are also an understanding of the nature of man and the nature of relationships. So. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, they're clear cut, they're not sharp. And I don't think that Matthew Arnold or you know, even the later liberal uh, philosophers of education would need to deny that. Um, uh, 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 so uh, the, the in intrinsic, extrinsic uh, distinction in educational philosophy is one of the most treacherous of all distinctions. Uh, but by and large, what it seems to mean in a lot of cases is that uh, it, it, the, the idea that knowledge can be an instrumental work is, uh, sorry, the, the intrinsic work is an attempt to resist the kind of more um, or default to be that like educational policies view of the value of everything in the curriculum as having some kind of cash purpose, you know, being able to yeah, having some direct practical purpose. You know, it, it's just to say simply, but there are other values than that, and one of them is personal formation. You know, but you're absolutely right to pick up the distinction because it's a, it's a dodgy one. <coughs> Nobody's quite put it right. Okay. Last question. Uh, I, I just wanted to raise a question about meaning making and its relationship with uh, uh, knowledge. And in some sense, uh, I don't know if I understood you right, but uh, it sounded to me like um, meaning making was a very, uh, it's a, it comes in the personal domain. Whereas engaging with disciplines and uh, with justificatory beliefs is, uh, comes in the public domain. And I'm just wondering is that, does this mean that we cannot uh, enter into each other's uh, meaning-making experiences, uh, you, you know, in, in public discourse? Does that mean that that is not valid? No, I didn't mean that. Uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, we make various kinds of meanings. And all those meanings uh, are not really uh, any claims about what is right or what is wrong is ethically or what is true or what is false. Uh, the range is much bigger. Also, the knowledge uh, or the knowledge claims which could be true or false as well as the ethical claims which could be right or wrong or justified or justified, they are also part of meaning making. But meaning making is much larger than that. And the problem actually does not arise uh, as long as we are sharing meaning with each other and uh, we are not claiming um, some sort of uh, some sort of criteria which makes certain claims are kept out and certain claims are taken in the real problem does not arise till then so, and therefore I was focusing on that this does not mean that the kind of meanings we make we cannot share with each other we can make them public in the sense of, uh, uh, of observing and enjoying together as well as maybe uh, but as soon as you make claims then the justification becomes important then joint inquiry inquiry of what you see if, if inquiry is supposed to presume that you will come to know something which you already don't know 
then you are making a knowledge claim. And though the inquiry will definitely require at least jointly accepted criteria, and if you tell that to an LG, then he will again question your criteria and you will have to extend your criteria to include an LG as well. Um, so, I think it's, a, it's good to close at this point um, of a discussion that is probably um, continue for a long time. Uh, so I would like to thank the panelists who, in spite of jet lag and short notice, agreed to be on the panel. And, uh, and I would also like to thank all of you for attending this discussion. Thank you.